Welcome everyone to another edition of Unravel Your Mind. It's a beautiful day in Southern California. I've been up and down the coastline from Venice Beach this morning, and now I'm in Laguna. And so I'm on the road and we don't know, there's could be lots of unexpected things that happen in today's broadcast. I've got Miss Lily, my Bali dog, um, right near me, and she's, uh, she's guarding my dear friend's place. And so she's going to probably bark at points in time and who knows what, what else will happen. So um, if there's any distracting background noises, we know why, um, but it's always beautiful to be here. Beautiful to have a sunny day since it's been rainy and cold in Southern California. And I'm excited to talk about a lot of different topics that are coming through. Um, some are from questions from individuals who have written me prior to the show. Some are from some girlfriend discussions that just took place. Um, I had a, an incredible evening with three other very conscious women and we had some great discussions. And so some of the thoughts and questions and topics that came up I thought I'd bring to the show as well so that we can we can all uh, hear the wisdom that's coming through and the things that we're all struggling with right now. There's some things that are sort of out there in the collective consciousness, but also things that are very individual to each one of us that we are working through. And so the whole point of being on the show and being here today is to help us to unravel our minds and to transform our relationships to love and to life and to how we exchange energy with the external world and at the same time know that everything is within us so it's that ongoing balance of being in this world but not of it straddling the third dimension and the much higher dimensions the fifth and beyond and the places that we like to play but we're here on planet earth and human bodies so let's jump right in to what some of the questions are that have come through for this week's show uh, this one um, is, is an interesting one. Why isn't it easier to get results from meditation? We drink wine and immediately feel a result. So why don't we get this with meditation? And I think this is a great question and one that, that I ask often as well, because there's some days where I meditate and I don't get anything. I just feel like I just sat there and watched my mind go round and round with some narrative, some storyline, some ridiculous idea or thought construct. And so um, those days, it doesn't feel as productive, but there's other days where I'm able to reach that really silent space. It may not be that complete place of enlightenment, but it's a place of calm and peace and knowing that everything is within. And we know how we got there. We got there through all the storylines and all of the, the ideas that we have about life um, and also the collective consciousness, right? The social constructs, the ideas that come at us every day when we walk out the door, we didn't have to leave our house to get some of the triggers that come at us. So meditating is a slow process. Everything about it is slow. It's all about quieting the mind being inward. And it's a practice like anything else. This journey is a journey, the spiritual journey. It's not something that we instantly achieve. Um, you know, Buddha sat under a tree for 40 days. Jesus walked in the desert for 40 days and, you know, and enlightenment was, was, uh, something that they were able to just step into. Um, Eckhart Tolle talks about, um, sitting and, and having a, a similar, experience. And so does people like Michael Singer, right? So why can't we all achieve this? And I think it's trusting in our soul's plan that we came here to have a lot of experiences in life, to keep ourselves busy, to have fun, to struggle and to work ourselves out of the struggle. So don't give up on meditation. Uh, Things are happening. Things are always happening in meditation, whether you're seeing the circuitous loops of thoughts that you don't want to be having. That's the fact that you can even have awareness of that is a big step in, in, in a direction of really self-realizing. So don't discount, you know, those, those baby steps that we make. And then sometimes we get those moments where we just drop in and we just can feel ourselves in connection with the divine and they're fleeting moments sometimes. Um, sometimes they're lasting moments. And, you know, I like to thank psychedelics for opportunities when I was able to experience that for extended states of time. And as I've talked about on many shows prior, 
psychedelics are not the ones that are going to enlighten you. It's the integration work afterwards and meditation is a big part of that. So I think psychedelics can help us streamline, take a few shortcuts, um, experience the embodiment of that oneness and to really feel into what it's like to be in stillness and to be in our soul's plan, not in our ego mind's ideas of what we're here to do, um, be, or experience. So meditation is something that is highly recommended. I've talked also about uh, flower meditation, right? Sometimes we can do a meditation just going and observing flowers and getting into the energy of mother nature. So it doesn't always have to be the traditional sense of sitting um, with our legs crossed, but there is a lot to be said for this because this is truly the way that we are able to, to really bring that stillness on a cellular level and not just constantly be trying to quiet our minds within the stimulus of everything that's happening around us. Look, even in meditation, there's stimulus, right? There's, there's babies crying, there's kids laughing, there's traffic going by, there's trains honking, there's dogs barking. So there's always things that are trying to distract us. And it's really about bringing in that quiet place of knowingness. In fact, one other example comes to mind that a dear friend of mine um, gave me because I, I live near a train. I'm not there today, but um, when I am, that train is actually really reassuring to me a lot of times because it makes me feel connected to energy in the city and places to go. But it also can be distracting when I'm trying to quiet my mind or be in deep meditation or be on a Zoom call or um, go live on YouTube or any of these things. And so one of my friends said, you know what I do when that train goes by? I just look at it as the trash haul away. And any thoughts that I have going on during that moment in time that are no longer serving me and, and I don't want to be in those, I just put them on the train and let the train take them away. And I thought, oh my gosh, what a great way to be in flow, but still be incorporating our external environment into it. Right. Cause that's the mindfulness. That's, that's how we can, can walk through life as, as the yogis will say, you know, yoga takes place, not just in the, on the mat in the, in the room, it takes place everywhere we go in life. It's that mindfulness. It's that presence. It's that, that, that inner peace that we're here to, to find within ourselves so that we can then exude it out to everyone else. So keep going. I know that was a long answer on meditation, but I think there's a lot of pearls in there that just help us understand why it's important. Even when we don't feel like we get the results that we want to have instantaneously after sitting for 15 minutes, 30 minutes, maybe an hour. So keep going. Meditation is great. It's a practice, it's a journey, and I commend you for sitting and making the time to do it and making it a part of your routine. Um, I just recently started doing this absolutely every day for uh, a routine and to, to do the practice. So, all right, let's jump into the next question. How do we surrender when we're in survival? Um, okay. Not knowing more of the context, I'm going to answer it in a particular way, knowing that there are many different ways that this person could be coming at this, um, survival. You know, when I think about that, there's like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And, and so for someone, you know, just coming from Venice, seeing a lot of homeless people, their definition of survival is very different than probably, and most likely the people who are watching this video, because, by nature of having a computer and having Wi-Fi and being on the internet, you may not be in that absolute survival on the street homeless mode. So I'm going to speak to it more from that state of there's something that's that's really working on us at a deep level that feels like we're having to survive or get through. Um, but it may not be the truest sense of survival and that we do have food and electricity and all of these things. And I think with that said, that leads us right in to the most important point that is always about gratefulness. It's about being grateful for what we have um, in everyday life in this moment now that I have a, a beautiful space and a beautiful place to be and to experience this with you. Um, I have a beautiful dog that brings me love, right? I have a hot drink in the morning. Um, I have a, a clean uh, glass of water. So sometimes it's going back to those, those really basic things. Now, the question was more about 
surrender, right? So how do we surrender? Um, I, I still work on this every day of my life, um, surrendering without feeling like I'm giving up, right? Because it's not that give up energy, like, well, gosh, darn it, I give up or, you know, I'm, 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 yeah, it's not that. It's that you're, you're giving it away. Surrender is giving it away to the powers that be, whatever you want to call that to be. If you, if that's God, um, you know, I believe in God's source energy can be referred to as universe can be referred to lots of different ways. So we won't get caught up in the, in the semantics, which are very important to a lot of people. They're not for me. I think that we're here to, to recognize source energy, God energy within us and something that we're connected to. So I don't see it as separate energy. I see it as, as all part of our wholeness all part of our soul. So surrendering is giving it, giving it away, not giving up big difference, big difference in that energy. And when we're giving it away, we're trusting. And yeah, I'm, I challenge myself all the time with this one because I like to do something and then see a result. I like to participate. I like to, uh, yeah, be in the energy of this dimension and to feel what it feels like to accomplish something. Um, so we're not talking about not accomplishing things. We're not talking about not participating. We're talking about giving away the expectations that something is going to happen as a result of our action. We take inspired action. So we're acting, we're here, we're present. Ah, got this download. Oh, got this feeling, got this, this, this feeling in my chest or this gut feeling that I should do this, or I should call so-and-so, or I should leave this message. And so we do that. Uh, that's the action we take but then we step away. I mean, I just recently did this, um, a, a dear couple friend of mine, um, I was on my way to spin class and spirit said, leave them this message. And I'm like, but that message doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make sense to me. Why would it make sense to them? And then I risk feeling embarrassed about like, well, what does that mean? And I don't know. So I went to my spin class. And I thought, well, if I still have the clarity afterwards, I'll do it. Well, afterwards, I, I still had absolute clarity that I should leave this voice note for these, these friends of mine. But I still had a little resistance because I was like, I don't know what, how to say it. I don't know. I don't know how to get into this. And so um, a little bit later on in the day, spirit, my higher self was like, you didn't leave the message yet. And I'm like, do I really? And I, I like to use the the muscle testing where you're actually um, asking yourself a question. And, and if it's a yes, um, it's your fingers are together. And if it's a no, they go apart. And if it's in the middle, it's probably because you haven't asked a question that is quantifiable in the sense of giving a yes or no answer. So you need to reframe the question. And I talk about this um, under the theta healing section in the awakening and healing handbook that you can get on the website. So if you want to learn more about it, I highly recommend it. It's great. And there's practitioners that, that um, will work with you on this and either train you or just help you get the answers that you need. And for me, I know that's been really helpful because I've been able to really fine tune that skill set within myself. Um, so I digress a little bit from the surrender when we're in suffering, but I think it's also about looking at the suffering as a wake up call. It's not sitting in the suffering as a victim, but listening to wait, why am I calling in this suffering, this perception of suffering? And it might be true suffering. You might sprain your ankle and you might really, really be hurting and really suffering. So I'm not, I'm not trying to um, diminish what suffering feels like, but there's always something deeper in the suffering in the form of a lesson for you. Maybe it's just to slow down. So how do we surrender? We give it away. We don't give up and we trust. We trust that source energy, our higher self, our soul's plan is stepping in. It's not even stepping in because it's always happening. It's always there for us. It's always available. It never goes away. It's just our perception of it that we think that it goes away. So hopefully that answers the question. If it doesn't, I'm always open to comments in the notes section, even if you're listening to this on replay, because it's, it's timeless. So we can talk more about it. All right. Let's see what else is in the chat. Um, we've got actually a lot of questions today. So thank you for all of you who have submitted um, questions to today's call. Um, all right. Knowing what you know now what would you do differently to avoid the Klaus situation or what would you tell others? 
Well, first of all, I would say that that situation was probably unavoidable because I needed to learn the deep, deep lessons of the darkness. I needed to experience, and for me, as you know, if you've read the book, Angels, Herpes, and Psychedelics, a lot of my lessons come through romantic love relationships, as they do for a lot of people, but some people choose health and and illness, some people choose family, some people choose careers, but for me, I really learn a lot, and I learn fast because because my heartstrings are so involved um, in these situations, so First of all, I'll just say that I think the Klaus situation um, and relationship was so necessary to my spiritual evolution and awakening. It didn't feel like it when I was in it, and it was very traumatic. And I know that there's probably still little bits of dusting here and there that that I continue to do. Um, even though I've done a lot of healing, there's always little remnants sometimes that come in and out. And sometimes they're just little tests, just like little intuitions, like, okay, um, uh, where are you at with that? not intuitions, um, initiations, right? So little like, oh, let's see, is she still good with that? Is she, did she really get that? Did she really embody that? Um, so those things come through, uh, for us. And so what would I do differently and how would I advise or, or tell others? Um, don't be so hard on yourself, (laughs) stay awake, stay aware. So if you're in it right now, um, yeah, you can't avoid it. You're in it. Uh, be truthful with yourself uh, trust your intuition and what that person's showing you. Um, if you haven't encountered your devil yet, um, or you worry about encountering another one because you have, that could also be the case. Um, I would just say, very, stay very, very heart centered, trust your heart, but know when you are coming from the wounds of a broken heart versus an open heart. So two very, very different things. A broken heart has, ooh, that closed energy, that, ooh, I don't want you to hurt me energy. Very, very different than a broken heart that's an open heart, which is allowing the light to come in and for you to shine your light brighter and to look at what were all the lessons that came in as a result really important difference. Um, I I have a blog that I did a while back. I don't even remember what I wrote exactly, but um, it was all about um, how I, how I, how broken hearts can heal. Right. And how I love heartbreak, which is so ironic and odd. I don't like it when I'm in it. Absolutely not. I don't really love heartbreak. I love what I can learn from heartbreak. So that's really the bigger, the bigger part for me is what, what am I here to learn from it? Um, Okay. So hopefully that answers that. And if not, please let me know. All right. So back in the chats and if anyone live here wants to ask a question, please uh, raise your hand and I'm happy to get to you as well. Um, I have an eclectic group of friends. Some are fairies, (laughs) some are super 3D. How do you recommend incorporating them when you're not sure if I'm not sure if they fit in. So I think I get the question. So um, what do we do with eclectic groups of friends and people that were like, yeah, I don't know if this person's going to want the spiritual discussion, but I know my other friends do. Um, I think we always have to remember that it's always about free will and offering, well, first of all, feel into it, right? Just feel into it for yourself is having that person there something that feels right how does my body feel how do i feel in my chest how do i feel um in my gut when i say yeah i'm thinking about um inviting this person and then um and i i I have one distraction that i have miss lily here and and i also have my friend's um beautiful cat and so they're doing a little bit of a dance at the moment and i just have to also be aware so that i don't get myself into a dog cat fight while we're on this call um so feel into it, feel into where, uh, where you're feeling about inviting that person. Now, um, if you feel tightness, then it might not be the right situation to involve that, that friend, but then I would just be honest about it and just say, I'm going with, with, uh, I'm, I'm doing this, or maybe you just don't invite them at all, but I'm just saying like, don't lie about it. Don't tell them you're doing something else that you're not doing. Um, express to them what it is that you're planning to do and let them make the decision. Um, You already feel it, right? So let them uh, make that decision of whether they're going to come or not and flow with it. So even though you might've had some resistance, 
you don't know if it was yours or theirs, but allow them to, to give their answer. Um, I think that's really important because we never know when people are ready. We have judgments and ideas about our friends and where they're at in their own awakening journey. And sometimes they're ready to pop and we don't even recognize it. Or maybe we're not ready for them to pop because we we have them in this certain box and this certain idea of who they are. So um, yeah, flow with it, feel into it and make the decision that's right for you first and foremost. But also I would highly recommend you offer it to them and see what they have to say, because you never know where someone might be on their journey, or they might just need the support. And you might not even realize the amount of support that they need from other loving friends. So I would never not invite someone um, if, if there's a, you know, an overlap of, of things happening in people's schedules. Okay, so um, do this is an interesting one. Um, let's see. Do you believe vision boards are helpful? Uh, I am a big vision board person. You know, I've talked about that uh, before, and I love vision boards because they they give us they give us uh, something visually to look at. But I love them because what they do is they give us the intrinsic feelings of where we desire to be if we're not there. But we don't want to focus on the disparity of where we're not. So if you're going to put something that's uh, maybe very 3D, like a car or whatever, onto the board, it's more about how you feel when you're driving that car for whatever reason. It doesn't have to be some spiritual reason. It just might be that you want to drive a Bentley. Like, I want a Bentley. Uh, But if I focus on the disparity of not having the Bentley, First of all, it wouldn't fit in my garage right now anyway. Um, But if I focused on that disparity and I felt the lack, then I'm going to continue to attract the lack. Basic laws of attraction, right? Um, But it's the energy of the feeling. And I think when we get beyond, which many of us that are on this call probably are, when we get beyond the earthly desires of it, It all comes back down to happiness, right? We all want to feel happiness. We all want to feel love. We want to feel love in giving love. We want to feel love in receiving love, right? And unconditional love is when giving and receiving are the same. We all want to feel that we're part of something, that we're not alone in the universe on a physical human level. Of course, we're never alone in the universe. We're always connected to source. But sometimes it feels lonely and it feels really hard to be here. So I love vision boards, but just don't focus on the item as much as the feeling, as we all know, right? Focus on the core feeling that you want to feel. And then if it ends up being a minivan full of children, because that's what your higher self and your soul plan actually is, is, is bringing in, then it doesn't have to be the Bentley. It's not the Bentley that brings you the joy. It's the experience of being in communion with your soul's plan. So yeah, don't worry about how it shows up, focus on the energy and how it makes you feel. And then vision boards are incredible. In fact, we just had um, a fun evening doing vision boards and it's fun to do it with others because you talk about things, you know, you talk about the details of things and you get into the details, but you're not attached to the details. So that's really the important thing. And you're in communion and having fun doing it. And it just brings, it brings the, the curiosity of what's to come as opposed to sometimes like the crap that we might be sitting in the energy, the thoughts, the, yeah, the situations in life. So, um, beautiful, beautiful opportunity to just really be in the energy when we're, when we're vision boarding. So yeah, I'm still a big proponent of vision boards and, uh, yeah, don't worry about what comes true. What doesn't it's the exercise of experiencing the feeling and then continuing to experience the feeling after the vision boarding project is done. That's why you're looking at the vision board, right? Put it on your phone, all of those things and, and uh, continue to feel into it. And yeah. Okay. So uh, I just want to make sure I have no problems going on with cats and dogs. One second. Really? Well, you stay here. So, all right, let's go to the next question.
Okay. How do you see the new earth? Oh, um, this is a good one. How do I see the new earth? Uh, I'm not really the person in some ways to comment on the new earth. I think that the new earth is something that already exists. So I don't necessarily think that it's new. I think that it's a perceptual shift and it's a, a place and a space in our minds where we have stepped through the veil, stepped through the illusions and are not triggered by what's happening in our external environment our upbringing, the programs that were instilled at a very young age, the programs that are happening, the wounds that that happened to us in the past, the projections of desires for the future. So I believe that the new earth can happen right now. Um, My feeling about the new earth is that it will be perceived and experienced as easier for light workers, way showers, unicorns, fairies, goddesses, um, who understand the multi multi-dimensional aspect of ourselves to feel in acceptance more, as opposed to feel like we're unicorns, that it's, uh, it's more accepted to be in the bliss of divine oneness. It's more accepted to be in the knowingness of other dimensions. It's more accepted to talk about aliens. It's more accepted to talk about our starseed origins. It's more accepted to, to really, and, and it, I don't like the word expected, but um, that that's what people are working towards is their self-realization more than their ego mind's idea of who they are right? Everyone's searching for who am I? What am I supposed to be? Uh, what am I, what am I doing? How am I making money? What do, where do I live? What do I buy? What brands, what, you know, all of that stuff is, is all very third dimensional. It doesn't mean that we can't enjoy expensive brands. It doesn't mean that we can't pleasure ourselves in, in, in third dimensional items or things, but it means that we don't have the attachment. It means that we are able to come at this from just such a different perspective and lens, but in the new earth, which has been happening for forever since the beginning of time that we've built lenses and perceptions, and now we're dismantling lenses and perceptions. So it's like this ongoing loop in humanity, but a lot of these perceptions have gotten very, very tangled and intertwined. And that's why it's feeling, I think, even over the last several months, as we move through this really incredible energy that's happening that there's this opening and as more and more people pop open and awaken and experience their own self-realization and their own awakening and they're on their awakening journey, as opposed to just talking about being spiritual, but they're actually waking up, doing it, embodying it, being it, exuding it, sharing it. That's the new earth to me is that in community, we are there every day focused on being there every day when we're not using our spiritual toolbox to help shift us to get there. That's really the new earth and it can happen right now. And it is happening right now. And I just think it's going to be easier perceptually perceptually to see it. I think that's maybe in my mind, how I would describe the new earth. I know there's lots of uh, interesting individuals out there that have different definitions. And so that's how I would describe it. And if you have a different description, I would love to hear about it. So please write it in the comments below. I'd love to hear how you, how you actually look at the new earth. Um, and if it's different than mine, or maybe it's the same, who knows? So I'd love to hear about it. All right, let's take a look at, uh, the chat, see what else we've got for questions. Okay. I'm moving quickly in a new relationship and would like to take it slower. And then that's looks like that's it. Um, okay. So maybe it's a fragmented thought. I'm not sure, but I'm moving quickly in a new relationship and would like to take it slower. Um, it sounds kind of similar to perhaps last week. Uh, 
but I'm feeling vibrationally, there's a little bit of a difference that it's almost like a feeling of, uh, like, like I'm on this train and I can't get the train to stop. And I'm not sure if I want it to stop, but I'm confused. Um, and I think in those situations, again, it's about taking that personal time that you need to really feel into what is it that I need, but also to not jump to projections of what we think this relationship is going to end up as. It's not about like, oh, is this the one or, oh, is this the, 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 the guy or the girl or the, you know, the person I'm going to build my life with happily ever after. It's not those questions that we need to be asking. It's do I feel in alignment with my soul's plan when this person is in my life, when I'm at dinner, when I'm walking with them, when I'm being with them, do I feel in alignment? And if the answer is no, that's still okay, because it might be that they're just here to teach you a lesson. Well, actually that's what everybody's here for is to teach us lessons, whether it's a friend, a parent, a child, a lover. It's always about the lesson and the core lesson is to just experience pure love, right? And to get there is through forgiveness, forgiveness of others, forgiveness of ourselves. And so take it fast, take it slow, just give yourself time to process and to feel outside of the chemistry and the chaos and the craziness of how it feels when we first meet someone because there's something in there for you something good something juicy and it may mean that you blow it up and you stay together or you may break apart and either way isn't the point the point is is how do I feel right now and if you don't feel like you're trusting that person wow that's that's something to really really feel into and then make the difficult decision about huh, maybe I don't want to explore this relationship. And if you're feeling guilted into it, or you're feeling you don't want to disappoint them, those are all good things to, to know, because it means that you have awareness, you have mindfulness about you and your feelings. And that's the work. And that's beautiful work, because then you're just asking yourself the questions, is this the person that's helping me with my mission and my purpose and my plan? And are they aligned with my soul's plan? And sometimes the most hideous situations and people are still aligned with your soul's plan because we have to experience those emotions. We've chosen to experience those emotions to help us self-realize. So don't be too hard on yourself. Dive deep, go fast, but don't give your light away. Don't give everything away to this person experience the person, experience yourself in the relationship, on the date, whatever it is, and speak your truth. Always speak your truth. Sometimes it's hard because we don't know what our truth is. And that's why I'm saying, step back, reflect on the actual relationship and how you feel, whether it's a weak relationship, a year relationship, how do I feel and how do I shift that? Not how they shifted, not what do they need to do, but what do I need to do to feel better about this relationship or do I need to move on? Or is there just a deeper lesson to get? So hopefully that's helpful. If not, I'm happy to uh, have comments below. If I've maybe misinterpreted what the question was, I'm happy to answer it again. All right. Um, Okay, so this one's a, a good one, and I, I like this a lot. Um, well, I like them all, but this one in particular seems like it has uh, some real depth to it, even though it's a very short question. What's the difference between selfishness and selflessness? Because I think as light workers, way showers, goddesses, fairies, whatever you want to call yourself, um, empaths, compassionate people, this is a real, um, a real hook. Um, a lot of times we feel being selfish is bad and we judge ourselves. Is that selfish? Um, but it goes back to that inner knowing of what's right for me. But in a way of how, how am I participating in the bigger plan? That's selflessness, where 
where we're not about our ego. Like it's not about what our ego mind wants. It's about how do we want to contribute in a loving, loving, caring way. That's selflessness. Selfishness is I want this for myself because. Um, Selflessness is being in a much more flow state of feeling and contributing, but not, again, not giving everything away, not giving our light away, not doing something just to make someone else happy. Although as a parent, a lot of times doing something for your child to make them happy is your happiness. That is what makes you feel happy. So it's really so individual for you to feel into whether it's something coming from the ego mind, which is being selfish, or it's something from the soul's plan, which is more the selflessness. And I guess the other thing that comes to mind is to say, you can still have preferences, right? Which is kind of the gray area that complicates things. What are preferences and when do they feel selflessness or selfishness? And preferences are an interesting one because I do believe that we are here to straddle this third dimensional reality and be in the fifth dimension and beyond, which means that we're in an expanded state of state of consciousness to where we can be very, if you want to say spiritual, awake, woke, and still explore third dimensional things. You can still live in a particular house. You can still own a particular, whatever it is. It's, we don't need to put the judgments on those things. It's about the attachment that we have to it right? So when we're selfish, we have an attachment to an idea of wanting something, a desire for something. It's, it's grounded in a different energy, a different vibration. Whereas when we're in selflessness, it's about an unconditional love that it's this giving and receiving. It's not always about giving. We can receive and we give and we receive and we give and we have preferences. And sometimes we go, oh, I don't feel good about that particular giving. So I don't give because that in that moment, for whatever reason, a thought construct, an idea, a wound a whatever, it just doesn't feel right to give, then don't give. But that doesn't mean that you're then selfish. It means that you're very in tune with your own truth in that moment as a human really understanding like how do I feel about that I'm here to have an experience and so when you get into that deeper place within yourself that accesses the inner wisdom right so when we break through the beliefs and the programs and the ideas that we have we can access that inner knowing that inner wisdom that inner truth that helps us stay in selflessness not selfishness Again, if there's any other questions, comments, I would love to hear them in the notes below. So please add them in and and we can either talk about them next week or I'll answer them on text. Let's go to the next question. All right. This might be one of the last questions, although, because we only have about 10 minutes left. Let's see. Why does family members, why, or so why do family members trigger me so much? Yeah, that's a good one because it's the family members that programmed you with all the ideations and and a lot of times with your self-worth and your value and all of those things hit really hard on the heartstrings. They're really deep within you. Um, They're ideas that you believe. Um, This is a weird story that's just coming to mind and I don't even know if I can tell it exactly right. But there was this family and the woman um, was preparing uh, a ham. And I think it was like for Easter or something. So the woman was preparing the ham and she took the ham and she cut like an, the end off of it and put it in the oven. And someone said to her, why, why do you cut the end off? And she said, well, because that's how my mother did it. My mother always cut the end off. And so I cut the end off. And so 
what ended up coming out later. So she just thought that's just the way you do it because that's the way she grew up. That's what she knew. And she learned later that her mother cut the end off because her pan was too small and would never fit the whole ham. Right? So we get programmed. It's a silly idea, silly example, but a funny one because it's, it happens all the time that we actually think something is right or the right way to do it or the way that it should be or a program about how we feel when it's just, that's just the program. That's just the, the installation of ideas of what we think about things, whether it's how we think about money or how we think about self-worth or value or success or failure or all these ideas, they're just ideas. They're not truths. They're just ideas. They're just beliefs that we have that when we dismantle them and we let go of them, and sometimes they're beliefs that we don't even think are limiting. We think that they're like strong, good core beliefs, right? Um, when we let go of them and we unravel them in our minds, that's where we get to the juicy, juicy wisdom and nuggets that help us to really see what it's like to be in this moment right now in presence, in flow, in the magic, in the divinity of our soul's plan as to why we came here, as opposed to the ego mind trying to tell us why we're here, what we should do and what success looks like because it's different for everyone. And if I had to define success, it's how deeply do you love yourself? It's how deeply are you able to be in touch with that aspect of yourself so that you can exude it out to others. And whatever you do in your day job is fine. It's all about that self-realization, all about that coming deeply within, deeply connected to your soul, yourself, and realizing that we're all one. We're all connected. We're all just here walking our brothers and sisters home. So that's probably the best place to end today's Unravel Your Mind show on, because we're here to transform relationships to love and to life, and we're doing it one day at a time and releasing one thought at a time in every moment of now, how we're choosing to experience our life, the decisions that we make, and the emotions that we, that we allow ourselves to feel. So I hope today's been fun. I look forward to next week. Please, again, if there's any comments, questions, um, additional things that come up, you can PM me. You can put it in the notes below. Um, I'll put some extra links in there so you can see some other materials if you're interested. And I so appreciate you spending the time with me. I think this is just amazing that you've given up potentially an almost an hour of your time uh, to just do that deeper inner reflection. So thank you so much for being here. Hit the bell, subscribe. Uh, you'll know then when we're live next. And I look forward to seeing you, hearing from you and being in touch. All right, until next time. Many blessings. Yeah.